Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome at this another virtual DDD. And with me today is uh, Christina from the organization. And um, hello. And today in the meetup, we will be talking about beyond the hexagonal architecture, functional core, and more with Bruno and Thomas, my friends from DDD France and PDD France, right? So happy you'll be here. They will give you a presentation for about, with some live coding for about an hour and 15 minutes, but please do type in the chats, YouTube or Zoom. If you have questions on Zoom, use the Q&A function and on YouTube that post your questions. Afterwards, we'll do the live Q&A. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for the invitation. Yeah. And it's all up to you now. Okay, Good okay, questions. let me try to push some uh, slides here. <clears throat> Just for me to ask, can you see the slides and see us all together? Yes. Is it okay. For me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, beyond hexagonal architecture, um, the idea of this talk came out one night in Paris more than three years ago. Uh, it was at DDFR Meetup Night, and I had the chance to live code with Alistair Coburn in order to explain what hexagonal architecture was and how to implement it. Uh, at the end of the event, while we were drinking beers, uh, Jeremy Chassin and Clément Boudreau were asking Alistair whether or not he was aware of functional core imperative shape patterns. The discussion was very interesting and I was saying to my inner self, that could be another interesting talk. Uh, three years after, we are here with Bruno to discuss and to compare both patterns. But first things first, let's present ourselves. Uh, my name is Thomas. I'm building software since more than 20 years now. Uh, I'm spending my time coding and creating efficient and happy dev teams, providing value with extreme programming and domain-driven design, and two, doing some strategic DDD consulting, architecture, and training to other customers. Uh, aside that, I'm an organizer of DDD French Meetup since uh, five years now, DDD FR. Bruno? Thank you, Thomas. Um... My name is Bruno Bucard. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, Kenny, to invite me with Thomas. Uh, on my side, I have uh, 30, yeah, 30 years of IT experience. I've been agile coach for 80 years, um, and uh, I'm also um, organizer of a BDD Paris Meetup. How are I on that today? Hmm. In first, a quick reminder of what hexagonal architecture is. Uh, then, the presentation of what the functional core is. Then, we will start from the code base in hexagonal architecture. And we will transform together into functional core imperative shell. We will finish by comparing this pattern with hexagonal architecture. Yeah, actually, Bruno, since I was also uh, recently involved in discussions on Twitter about what is and what isn't hexagonal architecture, I'd really like to end up our session with a question for uh, you, all of them, uh, all of you, the DDD audience, and, and it might help us also to break ice for our final Q&A session with all of you. Fine. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Our domain for today. Yeah, I, I, I wait for your slide. <laughs> It's okay? Uh, yeah, it's okay now. Our, dom our domain for today, uh, the domain will be theater. Uh, actually, not the reservation, not uh, the booking, but suggestion of the best possible seat for someone that would like to attend a show with a group of people called party. Party is a group of two, four, five person. That, that, so that's the domain. That yeah, something that should ring a bell to Kenny since we had uh, created a DDD training uh, all together using that uh, topic. So, uh, no, no new thing. Okay, okay. let's take an example. Uh, it starts with a, a request coming uh, from a customer that's saying uh, to our website, I want to attend to show Z and we are three. What seat can you suggest to, to us? The suggestion uh, API in yellow. Uh, 
So what, what do we need to, to do this job? Uh, we have to ask other backend information, such as show Z, such as a show Z matching a specific auditorium setting. Um, auditorium setting is, is a topology of a theater. For, and uh, we, we ask, yeah. And yes, uh, our API is making some API calls towards upstream systems handled by other teams, other companies. Uh, here we have the case with the auditorium sitting API. So we are owner and developers of the yellow API seat suggestions, and we need some external backend like auditorium sitting API. Well, when we receiving our request, the auditorium sitting API is returning the auditorium topology for this show. In other words, a list of rows, seat, seat, corridor, pricing categories for every seat, etc. This external auditorium sitting API is not aware of which seats are free and which seats are already reserved, all right? So our API in yellow must ask another backend, what are the available seats for this show, please? So this one, seats availability. You're right. And the second call uh, to another backend, the seat availability API. Which only return a list of seats name, okay? Now we have both the auditorium layout and for every seat, whether or not they are available, meaning not reserved or reserved. Our API in, in yellow can do its job. A job which is to find the best possible seats for this customer request, all right? The so core domain of, yeah. The core no, domain no. of our seat uh, subjection API is really to suggest seat. We don't want uh, to reservation, neither booking. The booking part will be done afterward by other system, by other API. To provide the best seat, we have rules, business rules, such as. Yes, such as do not separate parties of people. I find them adjacent seat, please. Whenever possible, try to locate them in the center of the row. And also something like try to suggest them expensive seats first, please because we have various pricing categories and if we can do some business with it, we are in DDD land, huh? right? So we do our secret source to find and suggest the best possible seat for a show here frame in a yellow, in the small drive diagram. We return our value suggestion. And some of them are made for pricing tier one, the most expensive, generally in the first row. Some are made for pricing tier two, less expensive seats, et cetera, et cetera. So you got it, all right? Um, Our website uh, will then suggest uh, those options to the customer. And starting with the best and most expensive rows uh, again. Yes, Thomas. <laughs> That's all we need to know about the domain for today. Okay. Um, but cool, thanks for uh, this explanation, Bruno. Uh, but tonight we'll focus on the architectural style, okay? And we have to have a look and to compare two options. First option, hexagonal architecture. Uh, this one will allow us to keep our domain code here in yellow, properly split and isolated from what we call the infrastructure code, located at the borders, uh, like we have the adapters. Um, the infrastructure code is the one containing all the technical frameworks, IOs, data stores, databases, etc. So we have one inside the hexagon in yellow or domain code, two outside the hexagon at the borders, all the infrastructure code needed to make it work with all the adapters, all right? And to go in and to go out, we are using ports, which are interfaces and part of the domain, uh, and adapters that belong to the infrastructure side and uh, at runtime that will allow us to enter and to exit this, uh, this hexagon. This will be possible thanks to the dependency inversion principle, uh, what Gerald Mezzaros wisely called one day, configurable dependencies, like, like plugins, okay? Second, op second option, yeah. Yeah, before the dive in the second option, we need to focus one sec on the specific thing about functional programming. We won't explain what functional programming is, we are not exactly a specialist, <laughs> but uh, we will focus on what pure function is. A pure function is a function that will 
always return the same output every time you pass a same input. This is possible if you don't have any side effect made by your function. No change of the global state, nothing. A procedure that looks like a function will return an output like a function, but it will not always return the same value with the same input because it modifies share variable or global state. Yeah, so the procedure that looks like a function, but which isn't on, on the right, is therefore non-deterministic. And it's what we call impure functions or non-pure functions. Okay, so this being said, Bruno, the second option after hexagonal architecture is functional core imperative shell pattern. Okay. In that option, we consider we will consider two things. First one pure function located in what we call the functional core in yellow here. Number two, non-pure function IO side effect that it will be located in that we call an imperative shell. Imperative shell is where we will chain all our function call as a pure or non-pure function to support our use case. An imperative shell is like a function script orchestrating pure and non-pure co function call. The yellow part, the function functional core, will never do side effect, never call an external API, never call a database. Pure function of functional core are fed from outside, meaning from the shell. Thus, the imperative shell may first fetch data toward external backend, database, etc. Okay, let's see the difference now on, between those two options, but uh, while we are in action, okay? First, what happens with the hexagonal architecture? Uh, here is our hexagon in yellow. Uh, what you can see outside the hexagon, uh, but within the uh, infrastructure um, code boundaries are, uh, is the left side adapter, the seed suggestion controller uh, in uh, light uh, color, right? Left side adapters are kind of front doors for our external users to ask questions to our component, to our API, to send queries, command, requests, etc. Uh, here, our main front door will be an ASP.NET web controller because our example will be in C Sharp for the upcoming uh, minutes. Um, so, uh, our uh, front uh, React website, whatever, the front end part, will send us an HTTP GET request. Something like on a seed suggestion resource uh, to query uh, string suggestion for show ZID and party of three person, for instance, on a query string, uh, for instance. Uh, this request is uh, under the, our web controller level, which is also our left side adapter uh, in purple. Uh, and this web controller slash adapter will do something uh, every left side adapters do, meaning first adapt from the infra data model here in JSON or HTTP query string to domain types and data structure, domain data structure, to, to call the domain code the hexagon using a left side port method. Here, the left side port is interface I request suggestions. And the method uh, will be make suggestions on that, on that interface, okay? And third, adapt back the answer coming from the domain. Here, it will be a suggestions made, uh, pure data type, uh, to do something that will fit the corresponding infrastructure layer. Uh, in other words, an HTTP response with HTTP codes, a content, etc. This is the overall process. But let's move into the new uh, step now. The web controller will call the make suggestion method of the hexagon. Uh, and the name of the hexagon, the, the domain name of the hexagon is a seat allocator. Uh, in order to suggest the best seats, our seat allocator has to work with an auditorium seating. In other words, the theater topology for this show, but also the list of seats that are already reserved for it. So before being able to work and to do anything within our hexagon, the seat allocator from the domain will first ask some information to the outside world. Here, two external APIs on the right, auditorium sitting API and seats availability API, the one that Bruno talked uh, earlier. Then the hexagon can do its jobs, which is to find and suggest the best possible combination of seats for this show and this number of people. And finally, returning the result, which is something like 
okay, you can have, have those three seats in pricing tier one, those three seats in pricing tier two, and, and so that stuff. Uh, let's sum up. A request is coming from the website on the left, handled by a web controller, which will act like a left side adapter. This left side adapter is calling the hexagon through a high request suggestion port belonging to our domain and implemented the seat allocator type. Seat allocator type from our domain will uh, need first to get an up to date auditorium seating. And it will ask through a right side port name, I provide up to date auditorium seating. This is the name of the, of the port. Uh, and implemented by a right side port in, in dark purple. Okay. This one will fetch auditorium layout in one hand and the list of already reserved seats in the in second time uh, and we'll merge them. Uh, for every seat, we will have the information whether or not the seat is already reserved. Then our business logic can work and, and uh, do the job finding the best seats. And our left side adapter will get the answer from the domain, from the seat allocator, and we'll wrap it into a HTTP response and forward it into our client. So it will adapt before uh, returning. Um, important. In our case, we have decided to have only one right side adapter, acting like a kind of anti corruption layer. We picked that option because we do not want uh, our domain code making the suggestion to be impacted by organizational changes from the outside. The fact that we need first to get an auditorium layout and then to combine it with a list of already reserved seats got elsewhere, it's an implementation detail from our seat suggestion perspective. It's an organizational detail that has nothing to do with the very specific domain of finding the best seats from an auditorium sitting. Uh, worst, it's an implementation detail imposed by external organizations and partners. Hence the need for an ACL here, as suggested by, uh, by DD, for instance. And in our case, we implement this ACL at the auditorium sitting adapter level, at the right side adapter level. But that's just one option. Another option may be to create and put this code into a dedicated API outside this component, outside this API. Let's say for uh, if there are many people needing this merging cap capabilities, this adaptation service, yes, okay, let's do a, a dedicated component. But in our case, since we are the only one interested in that adaptation, in that merging, uh, hence, we have decided to put it into uh, our SL, into the, our uh, right side adapters. Um, so, domain driven design helped us somewhere to somehow to protect our domain code from other bounded context, other external domain models, and breaking changes. This trade off is important because this is not an orthodox implementation of Alistair hexagonal architecture, which focuses more on the technological, technological sorry, uh, aspect of things. Uh, and not on the various domains and various contexts like we do in DDD. In an orthodox version of Alistair's view, one should have used two right side adapters instead. But this is where I disagree, uh, and we will see that afterwards at the end of our, of, of our session. Okay. Uh, sorry to, for this time, Bruno, but it, it's important for the end. So. I understand. I understand. We discussed a lot yeah. about that before. <laughs> Can you now illustrate the dynamic involved in, uh, with functional core and imperative shell, please, Bruno? Yes, I do. Uh, so, um, let's imagine uh, the very same request coming from our website, an HTTP GET uh, query asking for seat suggestion. As your previous example, it's a web controller level. It's at a web controller level uh, that the HTTP request will be handled. This one will act as the imperative shell for our suggestion use case. But contrary to your hexagonal architecture situation, our imperative shell will first fetch all data need by make suggestion pure function in our functional core. So you get, you get all the data first and then you call the core. Absolutely. Okay. Once your imperative shell uh, has everything to call the next suggestion, pure function, it will call it as a parameter, three person for, for instance, and up to date auditorium seating corresponding to the show Z, like yours. Okay. Uh, next suggestion, pure function of functional core will do the job and return a suggestions 
made through the imperative shell. And then, then the web controller will adapt this result to an HTTP response and send it to the client. Okay. To sum up, number one, the HTTP request is received by our web controller. Number two, the corresponding request handler of the web controller will be our imperative shell. It will first do some side effect by calling non pure function, asking, for, for instance, up to that auditorium sitting tree. The imperative shell will then call a pure function belonging to our functional core, the make suggestion function. This pure function won't do any side effect, only pure functional domain logic in order to make seed suggestion. And finally, the imperative shell will return the result as an HTTP response that will be sent back to the original caller, the website. So everything that happened in the functional core stays in the functional core, some kind of. Absolutely. No push, okay. Uh, okay, we, we talked a lot so far, so uh, let's show some code, would you? Uh, and there we will migrate an hexagonal architecture API into a pure functional core imperative shell uh, style. Uh, let me just uh, stop sharing this like this. Uh, sharing another screen. Oops. Any windows? Okay, just me. Screen one, screen two. Okay. Can you see my code, my Visual Studio code? Yes. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it readable? The size of the font and things like that? Yeah, yeah. It's readable. Okay. Um, okay. We have. What do we have? We have a solution, a Visual Studio solution here, because we will code in C sharp uh, for the seed suggestions API. All right. Um, this solution has many projects. The first project is the seed suggestion.api. This is a classical ASP.NET API, like Spring Boot, uh, thing in Java or something like that, uh, just for for the API, HTTP API uh, calls and, and web controller and things like that. Then we have the seed suggestion domain, which contains all the domain logic, uh, the seeds, the row, the seed allocator, the seed availability, show ID, etc., et all our value types, or aggregates, or uh, and we also have in that within the domain logically the port, the uh, left side port, I request suggestions, which is only one method, which is please make suggestions, providing a show ID and a party requested, and returning a promise of suggestion made. And the right side adapter, the one uh, in front of the SEL, I would say, uh, the get auditorium sitting, just a show ID, and I will get an auditorium sitting which contains everything uh, we need to, to, to work. So this is the right side port. Uh, then what do we have? We have the infrastructure code here uh, with some adapters. Uh, so here we only have the right side adapters because as previously said, the left side adapters are the web controller that I already have in the, in, the, in the API project. And last but not least, we have the tests, uh, some acceptance tests, integration tests, unit tests, and, and things like that. And um, this uh, is an uh, Maybe before, uh, I, I can just uh, hit the debug button for us to, to, to launch the, the solution. Uh, the solution will pop up three swaggers because we have also the external APIs uh, fake um, on local. So it will, it will uh, launch our API, the seed suggestions, but also the two other external backends. So it takes some time, but it should be there in a, in a second. Seed suggestion API, seed reservation API, which provides a list of already reserved seeds. So seed suggestion, I can use it, uh, maybe show seven, uh, a list of uh, six. And here, the answer, I don't know if you can, you can see it, but ex uh, expecting the show uh, with ID seven and party requested of six people, uh, I have no, uh, maybe I can zoom, I have no uh, suggestion to make on for the first tier pricing category. 
But I have two uh, suggestions made for the second pricing category and two seconds for the third pricing category, the cheaper. Uh, and and uh, mix is another thing we won't describe, but I have three suggestions of six seats uh, every time, okay? So this is how it works. I will do this and we will um, have a look at, at the code. Um, we can start by the test. Uh, I, maybe I oh, as, okay. One one comment. Can you zoom in a bit more? People on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Is it is it better like a this? A hard time. Okay. On Zoom, it's okay, but I think on uh, like yeah. this. Yeah, I think that would be better. Okay. okay. We'll see the feedback in the chat later. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Uh, you're welcome. Um, so uh, we are uh, writing acceptance tests a lot. Uh, much more than unit tests. This is another topic, but uh, this is an example of what uh, we call uh, outside-in pyramid uh, uh, TBD style. Uh, so basically, uh, we are seed suggestions controller should. We, uh, basically, we are testing the whole hexagon, meaning the hexagon with all the adapter uh, code, all but the IO. We, we want uh, do some kind of networks and, and, and things like that. So in order for our test, in order to be to be really fast. So in that case, we just uh, pick a show ID. Uh, and here you can see the, the description of uh, one auditorium layout, uh, the Ford auditorium, uh, tiny auditorium, because we have only two rows, first rows in front of the stage and second one. Uh, as you can see uh, with parentheses, it's uh, already reserved seats, okay? So the test is saying seat suggestion controller should suggest one seat when auditorium contains one available seat only. And the only available seats here. Thomas, can you remind us the number in parentheses is a category? Yes. Uh, if you can, if you see one or two, it's a, a pricing category one or a pricing category two. Uh, that's it for the uh, for the for the representation. Okay. So um, ex expecting having that uh, auditorium uh, layout, uh, I'm building my left side adapter because. As you can uh, remember, when you build an hexagon uh, null architecture, your main entry point will be a left side adapter, here the web controller, and, and the web controller, the left side adapter, will uh, interact with your hexagon, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a builder here, hexagonal builder, uh, with auditorium defined for show uh, this one, the one, and, and some JSON uh, files, and please build an hexagon with adapters but without IOs. And the builder will return a left side adapter, web controller, uh, which has a method get suggestions for. And here we are, uh, we get the suggestions made. We extract the value uh, from the HTTP response. And then we check on the, uh, I'm assuming that I have one property for five passing category, first passing category, and only one suggestion, which is A3, the seat here. Okay, we have many tests for that with empty, uh, empty uh, auditorium seatings, uh, other one. Uh, uh, we have lots of, of, of tests about, like this, but as they are with the power of same net, they are uh, pretty much looks like the same. Okay, only uh, domain and, 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 and variables uh, stuff. So if we are looking at the um, web controller, so. Uh, Know, maybe seed suggestion controller here, which is our left side adapter, as you can remember. As every left side adapter, you have uh, one method here for the HTTP GET method. So let's say you, you, you call it like this, uh, and the query stream is, is extracted from ASP.NET uh, framework. We are very in the adapters uh, land, huh? uh, including the, the code that I didn't uh, code but uh, that I'm using, like ASP.NET. First step for every adapter is to uh, translate from, left side adapter is to translate from the infrastructure code to the domain. So here we have strings and int, and we get some kind of value types uh, of show IDs and party requested. So it's the first uh, adaptation. Then we can call the domain. Here our hexagon, uh, uh, hexagon, the name is for the sake of uh, clarity uh, for our talk. Uh, we, 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 we use to, to use more domain-driven uh, names for hexagon, uh, but uh, we call the make suggestions methods and we get a suggestion that we wrap into a HTTP uh, response, ASP.NET HTTP response. Okay, uh, 200. Uh, so that's it for the uh, main usage. And if we look at the code of the hexagonal architecture, so this is the left side port. 
high request suggestions on the left, asking questions. And if we look at the implementation here, we have the citelicator, what we call the hexagon. And uh, pretty much it, actually, it delegates a lot of the uh, business logic to uh, other types like auditorium settings and rows, that's it. So we, we, you may have the impression that there is no lot of, uh, lot of code, but everything is behind the scene, uh, uh, behind those functions and, and things like that. So that's it for the, for the, for the overall uh, hexagonal architecture code. Um, yeah. Tour. yeah, yeah. No. So um, what, yeah. one question before we move on. Yeah. The code will be available in GitHub, someone on YouTube asked. Yeah, yeah. You can... at, uh, at the talk. Absolutely. Good. Well, uh, post uh, the link tomorrow, on YouTube. Or tomorrow if we make some, uh, I don't the know. The discussion is uh, too, too long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If you have to spell check or whatever, I don't know, but yeah, yeah. Tomorrow, tomorrow it will be uh, Tomorrow it should be available. Good. Uh, Good. Thanks. So you're welcome. So the idea here is uh, how to translate an hexagonal architecture into a functional core. Uh, yeah. As Bruno said earlier, we don't want to have IOs. Right? You don't, uh, and here we can see that yeah. there are- And it's easy to, to see. Uh, yeah. I, I can't really hear, hear you, Bruno, but- uh, ah, Sorry, I, I, I was, you heard me? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, okay. I just said that uh, because uh, in, in C Sharp we have an await when a function is calling IO, uh, there is only one in this code. And okay. This so one here, is here um, we will see that after if you want, but you can trust me, uh, everything is pure here. Everything is full of value objects and closure of operations and things like that without a, a state mutation and, and, thing, and stuff like that. But here we have a, an IO. First thing first, the hexagon take the, the data on the right. So what we need is to get all the IO and to push it uh, to the color. So instead of doing that call here, we will push it into the color. So easy, uh, I will uh, introduce a parameter on that line, auditorium sitting. And here, instead of doing the call, I will just ask the caller of this uh, function to, to, to call the IO before and to call me with the, the end result, which is the auditorium sitting. Auditorium sitting is really uh, our part of our domain, okay? Uh, I change that, maybe I, I'm, I, I, I will change the signature. Uh, I will change the signature here because I, I get rid of the IO, I think await. I will, I will return uh, a, a pure domain uh, object here. I don't need to return a promise of uh, a suggestions. I will just return a suggestion. As soon as I have everything to work with, I, I, I don't need to be a sync uh, in that case. Um, okay, I can remove the async here. And uh, it's okay. Uh, here is the hexagon. Uh, we, will, we will break the hexagon. So let's get rid of it. And the uh, left sport is not needed uh, anymore. And, and uh, what can I do? I can uh, also uh, transform, transform it into a make static to make this function, a, a real yeah. static function. Uh, and uh, I can make the class static. That's Cita Locator and said, okay, you have a private field, uh, auditorium sitting provider. I don't need it anymore. I will get rid of it uh, just right now. And I have one error here, which is uh, the, the constructor. The constructor was used by the hexagonal builder for our test. We will check that and fix that in a second. So here uh, I've got everything private, static. It's not the hexagon, it's the... Uh, Functional core, just for the sake of clarity. Yeah. Uh, okay, now I, I just <laughs> push the responsibility of fetching the data outside of myself as a functional core. Now I need to fix maybe what I've just broken, uh, in other words, uh, from the color perspective. And what is the color of the hexagon? Uh, Bruno, Christina, Kenny. Hello. What, what is used to, 
What is the col the, the caller? Yeah, the co caller. Uh, ah, the caller. Ah, it's, it's the controller. In French, <laughs> the controller. Yes, it's a web controller. So let's go to the web controller. Sorry for the accent. Uh, situation controller here, which is the one calling the hexagon that used to call the hexagon. And as you can see, since I break every rule, I, I, I transform this into a, a function. I will get rid of the await method. I don't need it. Hexagon uh, is not uh, does not exist anymore, so I will call it the sit uh, sit suggestion sit allocator. Now uh, it's my functional core, and here I can remove the hexagon. There is no more hexagon in that in that code, and maybe um, this is the call to the right side adapter. I will introduce a variable here to push it outside. Just for the sake of clarity here, and uh, I'll say uh, non pure function call. Okay. Uh, call the domain, it will be uh, pure function, uh, function uh, or core. Uh, and uh, I need to introduce a field for that because, as a web controller, uh, I need to fetch the uh, world on the right side uh, of me. So I need to, to have a kind of uh, uh, auditor MCTing provider. Yeah, we have Let to inject it. It's I provide auditorium sitting right side port. So here. Uh, and um, what can I do? I can get rid of the hexagon. There is no hexagon anymore. Okay. Uh, it has a parameter. Sorry? Even the parameter, you can get rid of the parameter of the hexagon. Uh, as the parameter of the hexagon, yes. Uh, I can see it maybe. Yes, okay, I will introduce. Yeah, okay. The constructor parameter. Yes. Uh, yeah. Before our web controller, our left side adapter needed to talk to the hexagon to, to, to make the job done. Now, you don't need it anymore because uh, I can write it here. Uh, we are in the imperative shell land. This callback, this uh, ASP.NET callback, it act like the imperative shell for this use case. So it will uh, do some annotation, uh, call uh, non-pure function calls, uh, pure functions, and, and, and wrap, OK? Uh, so I don't need uh, hexagon anymore. So I will change the constructor, because now yeah. I'm expecting to have an auditorium still provider injected that I will store into a, a private field. And make field read only. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't understand why I the auditor setting probably. I don't know. Maybe there is a bug with uh, Richard. I will, I will compile. No, no, no. It's clear. But why is it weird? Say auditor setting does not exist in the current context. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a uh, it's um, it's a field that I just. Yeah, it's a field. Uh, okay. Let me uh, test here. Uh, fix uh, fix the code because it, do it doesn't compile yet. Uh. Yes, but uh, I wanted to just to fix that. Rename uh, two. I don't know. See, there is a link, but it say uh, it does not ah, uh, okay. exist in the current context. Okay, let's see that maybe just after. Uh, yeah, it's not supposed to to, to, to have this, but uh, auditorium sitting. Uh, okay, let's let's continue, and we'll see that just after. So I have other um, build errors. Uh, can I declare a site allocator here? It's uh, since I break, I destroy the hexagon. Uh, every uh, uh, reference to the hexagon will, will, will uh, hurt, so I get rid of that. And I'm currently in the hexagon builder, so it's where I will build the hexagon with adapters but without IO. Now, the left side adapter, the web controller, uh, does not need the hexagon anymore, but it will need the right side adapter. Yeah. Okay, so let's put that here like this. Uh, okay, I have other errors. Uh, ah, yes, I return a left side adapter. Uh, yes, 
Yes, it should. It should be okay. Okay, let me check. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, build. Uh, that's strange. Ah, okay, I, I need to uh, to change uh, to change the type. Uh, yeah. It's really strange. Yeah. Uh, let me check. We rehearsed uh, yesterday and it wasn't like this. So it's a uh, it's demo. Uh, I don't understand why is okay. This one is, is correct. It's a uh, here. Uh, I said we destroy the hexagon. The uh, um, the uh, configuration, the startup of your of your of the API does not need. Uh, to register me to register an hexagon anymore into the ioc.net uh, controller. Let me build again. Okay, so it's building. So far, okay, yeah. it's, it's okay. I don't know why uh, Visual Studio. Yeah, it's really buggy. Huh? Six error where well, the the code is, is building. Let me try to go to the test. The term setting should. Uh, no, not one should uh, see suggestion controller should here if I change something. Uh, let's say twelve here should be red. Just check that my. Okay, it's okay. It's red. The test is failing, so I get back. So okay, I don't know why a sharper is uh, hurting like this with, uh, but. The code is working. Maybe I can run it uh, just to check uh, on in real time in integration uh, mode uh, and integration test and made integration test. But what you can see uh, before that, it's uh, okay. Our web controller is not using an hexagonal anymore. It's just uh, is now an imperative shell for our use case, doing a pure non pure function call, pure function calls. Uh, and, uh, and and that's it. No more hexagonal architecture. And if I have a look at that, it should be working. Just because I'm stubborn, uh, six seats maybe. Yeah, it's working. Okay. So uh, that's it for the uh, transformation. Uh, let me. Maybe I will push that for you, Bruno. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because um, I think we can make uh, more functional, maybe. More functional, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for Bruno. Okay. Tell me when and, you push. Uh, uh, maybe. Uh, ah, I should have. Um, Created a branch, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's let's see that. After. Let's see that after I push the. Okay, I push and it's on the main. Uh, I didn't. Ah, it's on branch. the main. You, you don't create yeah, a branch. Yeah. Just 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 pull the main, and we will okay. fix that for the for the for the code for the audience for tomorrow. Okay. So, I was kind of uh, yeah. This uh, all these real squeezels and such. Uh, Okay. Okay. So um, I can stop sharing. So maybe um, I, I share the screen. Um, so you were talking about uh, doing more functional style. What do you, what do you have in yeah. mind? Yeah. Um, um, Mark, I have to share my screen first. Uh, wait a minute. I leave you alone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So just uh, what we just did was to transform a hexagonal into a functional code. Yeah, do you see my screen? In our case, it was not, not yet. In our case, it was kind of easy because we had only one IO, one, only one IO. We didn't have a kind of yeah. chain of IOs, a chain of, uh, of steps. So you, maybe you want to to talk about uh... Thomas, you see, you see yeah, my, yeah, it's okay. my screen. Okay, okay, okay. I can so, see. Um, yeah, 
you see, Maximan, it's a good, a good sign because I, I would like to talk about it uh, just before uh, modify the code. Uh, so, um, Maximan produced a, um, a blog post about a maybe functor to bring a functional uh, test in uh, object oriented world. Why do that? Hmm. In language like uh, C-sharp, Java, the reference, reference type uh, can be null and leading a lot of um, defenses code. But the reality is worse because uh, developer forget to check a null value with a runtime exception as a result. Maybe class allow to contain a value or not. You can see uh, no value with value. The make class uh, allow to project uh, something uh, and um, offer the capability to get back uh, the value um, after processing something. If the process is failing, we can provide uh, a fallback value to uh, get a result. So the caller will provide the fallback value. Yeah, uh, the caller uh, provides. If you can't uh, get me a. Uh, a result, a valid result, uh, give yeah. me back my, my default one. Okay. Uh, that, that's it. And uh, uh, the, the, the maybe uh, class is, uh, has the capability to, to be compared uh, also. Okay. So uh, this is um, the way we can improve OOP um, development with this kind of class, because this class is written. Uh, in C-sharp, but we can port easily in Java, in JavaScript. So uh, it's not a problem of language. So I, I would like to show you uh, the blog post, the original blog post. Um, you want? Uh, okay. Uh, maybe it's like an option. It's the same. It's the same thing with different. Uh, it depends. Of the, uh, I can't. I can't hear you really well. So, I'm not sure if I'm not the only one. No. Same here. Same I here. Think his connection is uh, breaking up. Yeah, Bruno, your not, connection is not yeah, good. I know. I see. I'm sorry uh, by that, but uh, difficult to monetize that for me. Okay. Uh, so let's just take over then uh, the slides. Uh, okay. 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 I think, uh, okay. I think it's not improving quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Unfortunately. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's the. That's how it is now, right? Yeah, luckily, yeah. you're luckily you're load balanced. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so let me resume my slideshow. I, I stopped uh, the sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I will try to find where we were, and maybe you will be able to to. Comments, um, slideshow uh, from the current slide. Sorry, I had to, to find the, the, the good slide. Uh, live coding, okay, now, okay, I can share the screen on my own. And sorry, uh, Kenny, it, it took. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, that's, that's uh, how it goes. <laughs> it's live, yeah. Yeah, we can cut it out also later in the, in the stream. So uh, you should be able to see the, the more functional screen here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I already showed before this one. Uh, OK, so, so let me uh, move on. So uh, we, you are supposed to live code the maybe uh, option. Uh, and at the end, to um, to show yeah. code. So uh, absolutely. So um, after. This one is um, is beef. yeah is a function is a is a calling um, the modification of make association. You you can see uh, we rename uh, it with try make suggestion uh, because it's returning a, a maybe uh, and because in this case it's very simple um, there is no uh, all the function to call to process correctly. So we immediately um, get value fallback. And you notice 
uh, we pass um, the fallback uh, from the imperative shell. So the try make suggestion don't provide um, the um, suggestion not available. The default value, yeah. yeah the default value it, it provide an empty maybe. So imperative shell act on this decision and make the decision to put the, the value uh, itself. Into the suggestions uh, local variable. Okay. Okay. Uh, how to cope with multiple? Uh, in some other cases, you have to have kind of pipelines of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, so, uh, uh, Scott Washing of uh, functional programming uh, model we call ROPE uh, because uh, he, he defined two uh, track, uh, a, a green track. Uh, where every function is uh, uh, going forward correctly, validate, uh, update DB, send, me, send email, and uh, the error track um, where uh, we chain all uh, error function. So this, this model is, is really um, aligned with the functional programming. So happy passing green and everything, something is, is messed up you, you stop working and you go to the uh, absolutely, absolutely. track uh, it reminds me train, train, uh, the, yeah, uh, yeah so uh, uh, maybe four years ago i don't remember um we, we spoke a lot about uh, this um this slide coding about train reservation ticket uh, the goal was to optimize uh, the reservation in a train uh, regarding coaches. So, um, but uh, we were talking about reservation this time, like a booking. Booking was involved. Uh, yeah. Was not only suggesting seats, but also to, to book and to make some uh, some reservation. But but the rule was about um, reserv reserving seats. So um, as a the theater uh, seat reservation were um, our core domain, and we depending from other services, trend data uh, to obtain trend topology, booking reference to obtain the the number of the ticket, uh, and uh, trend booking to book effectively uh, the reservation. Pure Conway's law, uh, classic uh, thing, yeah, and. In that case, so you have more things to chain. We, we, uh, so this is a code of the train train reserve seats method. Yeah. Uh, yeah, after... we do exactly the same things. Um, the code of train train is also uh, value oriented. No modification, uh, mm -hmm. no side effect. So um, we have uh, at the beginning of the imperative shell, uh, two calls. The first one to uh, call the topology of, of the train we ask, trail ID, and uh, to obtain a new booking refer reference. Next, we call the pure function to make decision. But in this case, we, we need to book. And to book, we need a, an impure function. Book it. Oh, well, no, just before that. So yeah. the ticket office service dot try reserve, uh, it's our functional core. Yeah. And the try reserve method returns a, a, an option, returns a, a maybe. Yeah. And since it's a maybe, you can chain with the select uh, and and exactly. Uh, yeah. th there is a um, a little uh, trick because uh, our booking uh, um, uh, book seat uh, um, is an IO uh, function, so we we have an await and and a sync. It's meaning the result is wrapped in a task uh, type, and we don't want to propagate this task to uh, our pure function. So we need to unwrap it with another select. It's reason why we there is two select, two projection, before to get value a new uh, reference uh, failure. So the, as, first as select, before. the first select returns a promise. Uh, a task of uh, a result and, and reason why we need to unwrap it to get the, the value of the result. Absolutely. Then we can uh, call the get value of our fallback. 
uh, and the fallback is uh, there is a reservation failure for this trinity. And, and we notice in this example, so we, 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 we can um, uh, observe the, the power of the maybe um, tool because it, it, it becomes easier to, to chain uh, function. Uh, so uh, it's a way to obtain a kind of sure. functional uh, style. Okay. Uh, maybe we can sum up the difference between the hexagonal and the uh, functional core. Uh, you've made, a, you've made a, a slide about that. Yeah. Um, we, we try to, uh, it's not very easy because <laughs> it's not exactly the same spirit, but we, we try to, to make the exercise. Separate infra from business, yes, and functional uh, with Scott. <laughs> Uh, because um, oh, you said this? architecture, uh, we, we mix pure and impure function actually. So uh, the separation is, is different. So Bruno, I, I put the yes in yellow and quote unquote, uh, because for me, uh, there is kind of a um, um, different question, I would say. Uh, for uh, what interests me in the hexagonal architecture is to protect my domain logic from the technical code. So I used to have uh, one project, one module with pure domain, only ports and, and, and value objects and domains and things like that. And the, the technological and the API calls uh, towards the external, etc., is outside, is another module, another project. In the uh, <clears throat> functional style uh, in e here in C-sharp, uh, the imperative shell the, the, the dichotomy is not domain infra, it's much more pure functions, non-pure functions. So the uh, imperative shell is dealing with pure and non-pure functions, and the functional core is dealing only with pure functions. So the, the, the split is not domain and infrastructure, it's much more on the pure function and non-pure function. And uh, in lots of cases, my domain will be implemented both by pure functions and non-pure functions. Uh, I'm thinking about all the orchestrating orchestrations, uh, domain logic, you know? So reason why, I, yes, I, I said yeah, yes, okay, uh, but uh, it depends. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to think functional and it's because uh, it's, the granularity is different. And yeah, well. it's pure and non-pure versus domain and infra uh, yeah. for the hexagonal architecture, from, from my point of view. But uh, that, that is debatable and we'll see that maybe in, in just a few few minutes. Uh, second line is business code without side effects. Hexagonal uh, uh, architecture, uh, it depends of uh, adapter. So an, an adapter contain IO, so no. You're uh, right. And the fact that we can have a sync await stuff within our domain is a, is a sign of a side effect. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, second one, business second decisions. The domain has business part. Um, yes. Uh, for, same uh, as first. Yeah. Uh, for the same reason, uh, Thomas preferred put code mm -hmm. on yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Difficult to, to debate about that because we. I, we think it's two, two, two way to think uh, about design. Different, yeah. Offer good ability to test, yes, in both Absolutely. cases. About and techni technical. Uh, maybe we can have uh, power, uh, empowered more the functional architecture side because uh, the code is more reasonable. Uh, we can mo uh, reason more easily uh, about yeah. the code uh, since we don't have side effects on the pure. Uh, function side, uh, it's easier maybe to test. But anyway, and technical concern never leaks from domain. Of... Yeah, uh, for functional uh, architecture, yeah. uh, there are no leaks. I think away, for instance. Yeah. 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 No. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, okay. But by the way, um, does it make really sense to to compare them? No, uh, I, I think. Uh, it's too OP and functional programming is different. So yes, uh, does it make sense to compare two options related to two different and completely different paradigms? Uh, I don't think so, and I think neither do you, Bruno. 
Um, but uh, one can observe and learn. Uh, the adoption of one or another uh, will stand with uh, your context, as always. Uh, your team is using Haskell as a language, default language, but of course you will use the functional style architecture sure. with IO outside of your pure functions. Your team is full of juniors coding in Java or C Sharp. Mm. Maybe more complicated to have pure functions. And yeah, you yeah, will have to yeah. rely on value types, a closure of operation, and stuff like that. It's doable. We, we've made it uh, here and there on, on projects, but it's more complex. So there is no silver bullet. And as, as always, uh, uh, yes, it depends on the context and, uh, and the technical, uh, socio technical context you, you are working with. And that's good, actually. That's, that's, uh, um, OK, uh, maybe, uh, allez, uh, last but not least. <laughs> uh, yes, the, the, the title of the talk is Beyond Hexagonal Architecture. OK, so uh, yes, we can use functional core in some occasions, in some cases, to replace hexagonal architecture with it. OK, but we can also talking about hexagonal architecture in itself. Um, and we have a question for you. We have a question for you uh, in the audience. Um, this style, uh, the question is, does the following diagram illustrate an hexagonal architecture? So there are two answers, maybe answer C also, but first answer is yes. An adapter can be an ACL, an anti-corruption layer. Uh, I may do not want my domain to be polluted by upstream organizational changes and, and models and external bounded context uh, models. So yes, an adapter may be an SEL uh, towards and against more than one uh, external model context. Or you can answer no. I want to stick to a list of original motivation, meaning the technological uh, motivation, uh, and meaning that uh, basically one port uh, slash adapter per technology. So uh, I don't know, Kenny or Christina, if you have a kind of... Uh, or... I've, um, I've launched a poll for the Zoom people and uh, for the chat in YouTube, uh, just answer it please in the chat. So A or B, I'll type it also in the chat there so people can see it. So we will let you answer, it will be interesting for the... For the, for the so uh... there's already some polls in, but... Okay. Okay, 95% of yes, 5% of no. Cool, I'm happy to be um, a little bit less, 93%, 70% uh, of voting. It's, we'll let you, uh, let's 10 seconds before we-, we Yeah, five, five seconds, that's one minute, so- Five uh, seconds? That will be- uh... Yep. Okay. So the answer, can you? Is it? So the answer is uh, 32 out of 35 say yes. So 90% so uh, of yes. That's it. Okay. Uh, yeah, 91%. Cool. Um, so uh, following some discussion on Twitter, uh, my, my personal answer is yes. And I wrote it in that uh, blog, uh, blog post, hexagonal or not hexagonal. And following and, and some if, discussion. If, yeah. I, if I probe YouTube chat, I see mostly yes popping up there as well. So I see the same pattern in YouTube. So okay. now we have a fair research, right? We have two control groups and no, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> YouTube and Zoom. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Kenny. Um, so yes, uh, we had recent discussions uh, on Twitter about that uh, a couple of months ago, and I wrote this article saying basically yes, because for me, hexagonal architecture has become uh, uh, has became a, an umbrella term uh, nowadays, especially in the domain-driven uh, community. The the fuzziness of Alistair original article has something in common with Eric Evans' blue book. It's so conductive to various interpretations that it edges really well. Uh, and for me, it's a multifaceted pattern. One may have the same need as Alistair and pick it from technological plugin capabilities. Yes. Uh, one may pick it for testing, like Steve Freeman and Ed Price in their Tremendous Goose book. Okay. Another one may, like me, pick it because 
it allows you to protect your domain code from the infrastructure one, what I call the tactical DD facet. Another one may uh, also like me uh, pick it because it allows us not to have too many layers, only two infra domain, what I call the simplicity facet. Another one may pick uh, to have uh, quick feedback, focusing on the domain first and seeing late decision uh, about architecture, data store, and things like that when you know better the, 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 the domain. Or another one, like, like me or Julien Topsu, uh, pick it because it allows us to put some strategic DDD and anti-corruption layers in, uh, in right side adapters, uh, what I call the strategic DDD facet. Well, whatever, See, this pattern may be chosen for so many reasons, providing so many trade-offs and options that I really think one should continue to use it beyond, beyond the pure and original technological facet explained by Alistair. Uh, and and, and uh, um, maybe you can uh, have one thing, uh, sorry, okay. Uh, as uh, Rebecca Wirthbrook said uh, during those discussions with Alistair, Vaughn, Juan Garrido Pass and, and Matt Wine, uh, patterns will transcend uh, their initial writer's perceptions as people fit them into their own design context. So basically, uh, it means that if the community and uh, uh, think that we can view it like uh, an umbrella term or multifaceted pattern, why not? But this has to be discussed. And if finally we vote no, or we do not agree, uh, but means that the DDD community will probably have to find new names or new name or new names for all these usages. And I'm not worried because uh, this is something that the DDD community is kind of expert in. Uh, I mean, searching the best possible names for things is something that is a kind of reflex for, uh, for most of us. So, uh, that's um, that's it. Uh, maybe thank thank you for your thank you. for your patience. I don't know how many times we <laughs> we we spend. Uh, and maybe it's time for questions. If uh, we have a lot. Ah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is really hard to define to decide which one. Uh, maybe I uh, start with the question from Lawrence. How does the functional core pattern cope with conditional imperative dependencies? Uh, for example, maybe you need a second train if the first is full. You, uh, what I understood is that you will chain them into your imperative shell. Yeah. Your uh, imperative shell it will be a, a pure, uh, non-pure function, pure function, non-pure function, function, etc., etc. You, you will chain all those, um, and, and based on the maybe, on functor and things like that, you, you will be able to, to change them and to... Uh... So I'm, I'm really not a FP uh, specialist and a FP guy, I, I like it, but uh, uh, so I know there is a lot of debates. Um, the idea for us was just to uh, widen our horizon uh, because most of us are, are still working on, on code base uh, with uh, like stuff like uh, OP or worst uh, procedural uh, codes and, and like that. So the idea for us was to just to see something else and, and to make an introduction of, uh, of that. Okay, then the second one. Is it legal to interconnect multiple hexagons through ports? Ah, okay. Um, like for a modular monolith, something like that. Uh, so yes, there is a, a way to chain e uh, hexagons uh, and to replace some adapters. Instead of doing some I.O. through the network or thing like that, an adapter may be just something that calls another method in another package uh, through another left side port. So you can, you can connect, plug, and chain hexagon like this. And typically, this is what you do when you. Uh, I'm currently splitting a, a, a big monolith in a, in the hospitality world uh, where I'm working with my, my team, and uh, we are uh, preparing to split this huge monolith into various uh, hexagons. So yes, that's right. Yes, it is legal. I like the legal part. <laughs> <laughs> um, then one from the meetup. Um, would you say if you work with functional programming, then utilize functional core 
Whereas if you work with OOP, then you utilize hexagonal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we say that because uh, as we try to compare the both, uh, the comparison is not correct because um, f functional life programming um, has the spirit of function. We, as Thomas said, uh, as a granularity in functional programming is function. And sometimes we have a pure function, sometimes we have, we have impure function. So uh, the pattern uh, functional core uh, imperative shell is aligned with the functional programming. Uh, do, do it in, uh, in OP, it can be uh, to learn the pattern, but uh, you, you, need, uh, uh, you need before uh, uh, have all your um, OOP code uh, without any uh, side effect for your pure function. It's quite uh, difficult. So uh, the step may be high because uh, if, uh, indeed you have to uh, work with value objects, with closure of operations, no mutation, local uh, uh, variables, and etc. So um, and since I, I'm uh, I, I've made it only once in production with my current team. We were thinking about uh, uh, one component that was um, uh, ready for that because it was not a kind of orchestrator or something like that. We, we, it was just something that doing some logics upon some inputs. So in that case, I, I, I suggest them, do you want to have fun and, and to code it in a functional core style, because, despite the fact that we are in C Sharp? And it, and it worked, but it was really for that use case, pure, simple. And, and I, I'm not really fan of the, uh, um, I really like to split my domain code from, from, the, from the technical uh, code. And uh, the imperative shell uh, has some domain logic or may have some domain logic. So I, I'm not really a fan of that. So uh, in, except in that case, uh, not just for, uh, Katars and stuff like that, I guess. Okay, the next one. Uh, we have two, I think, uh, somehow similar uh, have, from YouTube. Uh, have you tried with IO monads to have less logic inside the controller? Uh, personally, no, but uh, yeah, why not? Should be fun. No, no, and here is one from uh, Peter Tillman, uh, somehow similar. Why not delegate part of the imperative shell in separate namespace or module uh, from the controller to still have the clear separation between infrastructure and domain? Yes, yeah, it's possible. Uh, mm. uh, it, it was a case for the train uh, example. The imperative shell was a separate place, class, uh, but uh, to be aligned with um, hexagonal uh, architecture where we made uh, this decision to use a controller as a, a left adapter, uh, we, we use this controller as imperative shell, but it, it's perfectly, perfectly uh, correct to, to create a specific class for that. I, I would love to have more details about that in order to, to chat maybe on Twitter or maybe on your forum. Uh, yes, I would like to, why not? I didn't get it. Maybe I didn't get it right. Uh, so why not? Uh, Bruno, you, uh, you should probably look at the camera because uh, we, we can't see your face when you are talking. Okay. Okay, please. Okay, now one about the design. Uh, isn't this example uh, a distributed monolith, one service calling to other services synchronously? Maybe they weren't synchronous. This was the first question at the beginning. Ah. It was about the seat uh, API and the... Okay, okay. Uh, if the function is pure, there's no uh, IO inside. It's not necessary to use uh, asynchronic because it's, it's don't take time, uh, except it's inside. Uh, we, we make a very long loop, uh, etc. cetera. But, uh, um, I, I don't understand why I need to, to have a synchrony in a, in, a, in a pure function. It's not necessary. I think the idea was to chain various hexagons. Uh, yeah, but... Every, uh, hexagon being, every hexagon being pure uh, functional cores and, and, and messages among them and things like that, maybe. Or, uh, same, uh, 
I'm not sure I, I fully grasp the, 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 the question or the, or the context, so I would love to, to discuss it. I, I think it was at the beginning, um, as you show the diagram. And then the we diagram. had the core domain in the middle with yellow and two cores uh, to the APIs which were merged. And then it has to be synchronous because you have to merge them somehow. Yeah. 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 Okay. In that uh, non-pure uh, yeah. side. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. From uh, uh, Valentin again. How do you handle the source fetching that happen on the under some circumstances in the domain? Like, um, if some condition happens, uh, fetch resources. That 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 was my uh, main questions when I, I was starting playing with that. That was really my main uh, question. And the what I, I discussed it about that with with some people, uh, very FP uh, oriented uh, dev. And uh, as I understood, it was uh, you have your imperative shell uh, uh, orchestrating. Uh, everything and and with uh, maybe and uh, other functor, uh, you go in functional core, you you, uh, you 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 take the decision to continue or to go through another uh, function, pure function, etc. So it will be scripted in the imperative shell. Everything, the, the logic of the think um, uh, orchestration yeah. will be scripted in the imperative shell. Um. Can I, I am I am coming from .NET and I'm working in Node.js for years and uh, the Scala in between. I would say this this belongs to who who decides this. If I decide to fetch something, then it's the wrong thing. I shouldn't decide. I should always fetch and decide what to do with the result. But the, I would I have to give all the uh, options to this resource and they can decide which. Uh, if they give me something back or not. Yeah. It depends like which the is the condition. The condition is not to fetch. I should always fetch, but I should give all decision makers, all options to the service to decide. If I decide if it, if it is a, de a dependency or optional dependency, then it should be a maybe or a, uh, yeah. Yeah. an option and not a, not a condition. Yeah. Um, okay, um, where will you go? Uh, are there enterprise-sized case studies on this pattern? I don't know which one. I assume the functional core, uh, or it has been, or has it been only been done in small proof of concept? No, no, no. There are lots of projects. Uh, when you are doing stuff in Haskell, for instance, uh, this is how you do the, the stuff. Uh, functional, yep. actually, actually uh, functional core imperative shell. Uh, um, I think it's Gary Bernard that that write it uh, first, but it's a uh, functional architecture, basically. Yes, yeah, very, very old. And, and there true. are lots of uh, people. I know that uh, Jeremy Chassin, for instance, in, in mm -hmm. F-Sharp, is, mm -hmm. is doing that since uh, years. Uh, uh, some friends doing Haskell uh, stuff in production also. Uh, so no, it's a, it's a real, it, but... It, uh, even uh, even then in, um, in GS, uh, because GS, is coming more functional uh, and uh, it's possible to do, uh, to do that in GS. So. But I'm not aware of uh, something like that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not just a, a fancy topic for, for Meetup. It's, it's, no, 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 no. It's, uh, it's, it's really used by uh, the, the functional com community. What is less real is the way we do. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The way we implement it in C Sharp, for instance. Uh, but the, the idea for us was. Uh, Maybe to, to give some ideas of uh, maybe we can go outside and do uh, other languages and have a look and, and compare what's, what we can, uh, our mindset. And, uh, I think it's uh, a good idea. A Scala is working, a Scala is ideal for this uh, because you have everything what you need. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's too much. <laughs> maybe it's too much, yeah. It, it allows you to do everything what you want. <laughs> So uh, I think we handled the second, the next question too, which development environment uh, programming language frameworks support functional core imperative shell well? Oh, uh, a lot because uh, I, I, I was speaking about the JavaScript because JavaScript is, is the new JavaScript is really functional. So uh, it, it's possible to do in JavaScript. And I've seen on, on, on 
an internet uh, in implementation of maybe in JavaScript. Uh, so. Yeah, but the question was uh, much more on the functional uh, side yeah. or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I assume it was for Meetup. You don't, need, you don't need framework. You don't need a framework to do, to do functional uh, core. Uh, no. Uh, in, in our C sharp uh, land, we need something uh, easier for us to, to code uh, with the value types and things like that. But that's it. Uh, but it's straightforward. Yeah. You have the same thing in. Um, I would say if. Of, uh, OP uh, language, uh, Java, Ruby. Uh, but I would say if you see someone sending a framework for doing uh, ah. core, uh, please, uh, you can you can rush and you can mm. run away maybe. So then uh, we have two CQRS questions, um, and I wouldn't want it to answer myself. So uh, <laughs> how does this relate to a CQRS event sourcing architecture? Sorry, what, what is uh, how does this relate to a SQLS event sourcing architecture? It's orthogonal, I would say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't. Uh, we have another one how to handle functional call and imperative shell with command mutations in SQLS context. Um... I, I don't see any links between mutation. When we said mutation, we said um, we communicate uh, with another service, uh, we store in database, yeah. for instance, and uh, secure arrest because um, we store in the state of um, application uh, every event. Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure to understand the question. Uh, no, actually, I think uh, one, one good answer would be, uh, maybe it will be a, um, a, 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 an ad, uh, but uh, uh, next uh, Thursday, not this one, but the 11th, we will host uh, Jeremy Chasson that will uh, talk about uh, one new discovery he has made, recently made, uh, about the endofunctor and things like that, uh, uh, especially applied in, in uh, event sourcing. So I think that it may answer to that questions and it will probably uh, a really interesting thing. Uh, it's on DDFR, uh, uh, I will, uh, we will send the invitation uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll open the event tomorrow, uh, but uh, so it may answer to that question. So Jeremy Chazin is working since more than 10 years about functional event sourcing, uh, thinking a lot about it, asking itself a lot of questions. Yeah. And I think it, it, it may be a jaw breaking, uh, uh, yes, presentation and, uh, and uh, so it's, it's brand new, it's just breaking new since the, a, a it, it should be ago. Thomas, it should be in English or in French? It, it will be in English, it will be in English. So, so uh, everyone is, is welcome for, for that if, if you are pleased with the functional and even sourcing, uh, it will have the answers. <laughs> okay. Um... Before can I uh, end up with us here, the functional core can be viewed as a simple way to inject dependencies as pure values rather than impure objects. Oh, you, you, actually, you, you you give the pure values to your functional to your pure functions. Yeah, actually, yeah, no side effects. Uh, everything should be ready to to work, uh, immutable and things like that. Yeah, this is the next step to functional objects uh, to functional programming you don't give values but you give functions absolutely yeah. um, and then we have another one maybe, maybe is answered with it how to how do you avoid the duplication of the fetch done in the controller and you have several api controller with functional core oh. um I think uh, the, 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 the capability of the functor as maybe for OOP to uh, offer the projection uh, is a way to avoid duplication of the fetch. Uh, because um, when we do, for, for, for instance, it's a train example, we, we, we look for um, uh, seat in the coaches, but we need to book after. If we book, if it succeeded, uh, but booking is part of um, the domain. We need to book, but the booking is impure. So in, in this case, 
we, we chain and we, we need to um, obtain, uh, uh, obtain a, a mix between pure and pure. But we, we can imagine, uh, and this, we, we, we don't have an example, but uh, we need to, um, uh, at the middle of the, of the chain, uh, call uh, another API, for example, uh, I don't know, um, um, information to complete uh, the, the, the chain. So I think the, the, the capabilities to um, uh, obtain or stream the value in the middle of, of the chain is possible. Uh, it, it's, it's a problem of design of, uh, of, your, uh, of how you, you chain your function. It's not necessary to, to call all uh, your um, uh, information before to call the pure no, function. No, no. We, we, we um, it's, uh, it's maybe it's a deformation, or I don't know how to, to say it, but we, we wanted to, just for people that are not aware of uh, FP and things like that, we just want to have a simple example of, uh, of it. So we thought it was uh, more clear to, to explain that we need data before uh, being able to execute pure functions. Yeah. So we take that very naive. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but uh, now we yeah. in, in life we will call functions that we call function and we call functions and uh, it will be uh, more um, less naive, I would say. Yep. Uh, okay, uh, Eros, uh, how best strategies for exception handling, validation, and user management? And how to handle infrastructure errors, exceptions? Ah, exception. Uh, I think you you avoid exceptions. Uh, you try to avoid exceptions as much as possible, and you and you are using the rope, the railway oriented uh, uh, programming uh, to 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 chain uh, your maybes, your your functor, and see like that. And this yeah. is how you you will, uh, you will uh, yeah. uh, react. And, and this is what uh, Jeremy Chassin was saying to Alistair. It was a uh, 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 the uh, the idea of uh, Jeremy at the time was to say no, uh, I, I I don't really like to have exceptions within my domain code, uh, and I want the errors and things like that to be domain events or, or domain uh, first class citizens uh, instead of being technical uh, uh, exception. And uh, so um, yeah, exactly. You handle them. Yeah. You you yeah. don't have. Uh, or exception any, anymore, anywhere, but you have a handling error case, which yeah. is in, uh, which would be an, an error event or uh, a, a handled answer, and yeah, not a yeah. Tor exception. Yeah, 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 yeah Christina, but the, the goal is to handle the, um, the exception, but transform it in um, domain error. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, in, in our yeah. case, to chain. Uh, exactly. Yeah. To, to be able to handle all these cases and not be, have yeah. a accidental situation. Yeah, absolutely. This is, yeah. OK. Um, um, oh, this is a longer question. I don't know if we have time <laughs> from Patrick. Uh, uh, in my opinion, as many patterns in OOP and DDD, especially technical, are workarounds which are not needed when using function core, functional core with FP patterns. Opinions. Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, I it was a short answer. That was, that was a long answer. <laughs> no, no, as, yes. as we said, uh, you, you won't compare chocolate with celery or something like that. Uh, within one world, one paradigm, you will use the tools properly adjusted and adapted for the paradigm. Yeah. And uh, it's okay. You can. But it's, we, I'm not interested in, in language or war. Actually, uh, it's been so many years. Uh, for me, the real pain is uh, uh, between people. The, the lack of communication between uh, developers and and business people uh, is uh, hurting much more. I guess. Enfin, no, I guess I'm experienced uh, that all my career, uh, much more than I'm using that language or that language. Uh, for me, language are kind of just tools. They are tools. And what I need, uh, what I'm interested in is to, to find value and to help people. Uh, so I don't care, uh, actually, languages. And, it's fun among us doing conferences and around coffee and to, to compare and stuff. But, for me, it's not the 
not what I'm interested in, actually. Okay. Uh, Could <laughs> uh, <laughs> you um, one one question from the beginning of the uh, of your uh, coding or the presentation? What happens when the auditorium seating API is down? <laughs> I think we solved this. Uh, we have an error handling yeah. handle the main event. Uh, no seats to sell today. Yeah, and and you just answer. Uh, I can't yeah. work. Sorry, you know. Yeah. Please come back later. We are we are closed now. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you share the tool you are using to document your tests with the images? Yeah, it's uh, image comments. Yeah. On Visual Studio, image comments. It's a free plugin. Uh, image comments with a, with an S comments. Yeah, yeah. I told her I push the code uh, with. Um, um, maybe function. So if you want, you can make public uh, the repo. Yeah, maybe we will switch and, and put some tags for before and after something like that. It will be clear. Okay. Uh, we will make it just after, and then we will release the code. Okay. It'll be easier for for people to see the before and the after and, and be yeah. able. To it would be better, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and the last one, can we say that the imperative shell has the same level as the application layer of the onion architecture? Oh. Uh, can, can you please repeat what? Uh... Yeah. The imperative shell has the same level as the application layer of the onion architecture. Okay. Um, um, I personally, yeah. I don't really like uh, that. Onion. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Hexagonal architecture. Uh, no, no, no. Bruno and I will, I will answer after. We, we, okay, did, okay. we disagree on that, but uh, okay. Okay. I, I was speaking about gra granularity. Uh, the granularity of onion of uh, hexagon uh, is for, for me is the same, uh, even it's different uh, about design. But uh, yeah, the um, the the granularity should be uh, equivalent for. If I, so my, my answer is uh, I, I don't really understand why I do need to have an application layer. For me, and this is one reason why I like the diagonal architecture and maybe it's a, a specific style of using it. I like to have only two uh, domains, uh, not two domains, two, two, two zones, the one for the infra and, and the other for the domain, because for me, Unless you are using a shared kernel among uh, various projects, all my domain is here to sustain and to uh, support use cases. I don't want to code any domain logic that won't be involved in uh, the, the, the one use cases for my, for, for my application. That means that uh, I, I don't understand the need of finding some kind of core, you know, core domain, uh, no, uh, not the core domain in the DDD sense. Huh? I mean, uh, a, a core uh, layer, a core domain layer yeah. versus an application layer. Because for me, application uh, and, and, and domain uh, is part of the domain. The use case is part of the domain, should be used, uh, part of the domain. And every time I've seen some uh, layers, separation like this, I'm asking, why did you split those two layers? And I almost never have... Um, uh, an interesting or valid answer to that question. Unless you are using a shared kernel or unless you want to invest on a shared kernel. But for me, as I have experienced it, shared kernel is almost uh, almost uh, an anti-pattern. Uh, so, so, so for me, I don't understand why we, we like to split. And since I came from a world where we used to split Split, 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 layers, 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 everywhere. I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm kind of uh, allergic to that extra. So, yeah. To make things worse, if you call application and you call application layer in the conversation with your business, they will start thinking in terms of application as well. And that's something I want to avoid because that's one big anti-pattern as well in, 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 in business versus IT thinking. Yes, yeah. it's a yeah. technological, it's a technical, uh, yeah, mindset. Yeah. Of, yeah. And, but, but my answer was not about that, uh, it was about granularity. Granularity is. Uh, yes, but the question was about that. 
<laughs> but not for me. Uh, it, not for me. But for me, it, the question was um, if uh, if that if shell uh, were um, the same granularity of uh, of the kind of uh, same level, not granular, same, same level. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's valid. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, because if I, I you think like, if, uh, if you it, like to have application layer, yes. Sorry, take take an example as we done. Uh, the code in the shell was a controller. In hexagonal architecture, it was a controller too. Yes, but uh, for me, the the in the uh, um, in the uh, hexagonal uh, style that I'm used to practice, uh, left side adapters is just an adapter. It does not have some kind of application or. It's it just uh, um, it's just adapters for me in the way I'm I, I'm coding stuff. So uh, whereas the uh, imperative shell may uh, call this, call that, uh, doing some kind of domain logic, orchestrating uh, calls, etc. So yeah, the granularity the granularity is is very thin. Uh, so you, you you see the orchestration of the call of the of your domain. Yeah, right. Uh, I agree. Uh, say a consensus by exhaustion. I think it's. Uh, I don't know if it's in English, but uh, in French we have. Uh, it's a consensus by exhaustion. By everyone is is tired about uh, <laughs> that discussion. So you say, okay, okay, yes, yes. So we have. Uh, we, we used to have the discussion with Bruno, uh, uh, and it's always end like this. <laughs> I I think in in the days of of business is the name is wrong. Application layer is just. What is the rest? <laughs> is this not my application? Yeah. <laughs> it's a part of it. Is the application is a part of the application. How plain fact is this? So <laughs> it may be only the name. Mm. And now we don't have any questions anymore. OK. Cool. Great. Then uh, that was it. Thank you, Thomas Bruno. Finally, after months of nagging you, <laughs> this is awesome. Thanks. Thank I you. really enjoyed it. I hope the rest uh, enjoyed it as well. I loved uh, you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, the live to, coding again. to facilitate this meetup. Thank you, Kenny. And thank you for everyone watching the live stream and for yeah. everyone in the Zoom. Thank you for participating, your questions and everything. We'll be back in two weeks with another meetup where Sophia will be talking about transformation business model in the pandemic. And we have three more meetups lined up afterwards that we will publish very soon. <laughs>